Hey, Barry, do you know who's here today? You don't know who's here. I'm just going to tell you. Adam Gordon Bell is here today. Oh, man. Wow. I, I know. Can you believe it? <laughs> wow, man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, little, the one at the end is my favorite. Here it is. Wow, man. Wow. <laughs> he's really he's really wowed by me honestly. that's just yeah and and um barry what do you think about the fact that me as the host with my interviewing skills has to interview adam gordon bell senseless really you don't think i'm a good interviewer you're bored we'll send you to north korea in a labor camp and you learn what bored is <laughs> <laughs> they're bored man Man, well, that's my other favorite. Well, you heard it. Adam Gordon Bell. Let's see if he... Ah! I was gonna, I was gonna, oh, he did grunt! He did! Ha! Welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show. And it's so funny now, I don't even have to remind my guests to grunt. They just do it. I am so happy you're here. Welcome to the show. This is the show where we talk shop about all things podcast production, the technical audio production. We don't get into marketing and social media and all that stuff. It's all about the audio engineering aspects of podcast production. I have a background in audio engineering in the music business. And since I entered podcasting, I'm really trying to help uh, podcasters and help educate everyone how to produce better audio. And if you implement the best of what you learn here, your podcast will sound a lot better and you'll spend less time producing them because time is money. That's what they say. That's what other people have said. So it must be true. Barry. That's a mystery. I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I keep doing that. I go, ah, you hear that? I'm like, ah, that sounds great. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adam's like, oh, that sounds great. Well, Adam Gordon Bell is here. Hold on, I'm looking for a sound clip. What is this one? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I, I meant to play the... Where's my applause? All right, well, Adam Gordon Bell is here. He's the host of Co-Recursive, which is a podcast show about uh, software engineering. And you do interviews there. You live in Canada You've been a software developer for many years, and I'll put your Twitter handle in the description, as well as a link to your show. Adam Gordon Bell, welcome, brother. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Another <laughs> session. Remember I used to call them sessions of the podcast engineering show, and then I would forget and call them episodes and be like, no, I meant session. Anyway, <laughs> I'm happy to have you here, man. So let's start with the speed round. Wait, well, first of all, how long have you been doing your show? Um, I guess like over a year, let's say a year and a couple months. Okay. How many episodes? Maybe 30. 30. Ah, that's good. All right. Well, let's do the speed round. So, um, oh, and, and when you do your interviews, you, are you the only one in, in yeah, person so, there and you do the interviews online? Yeah. So it's me with the guest and I uh, use Zencaster for that. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's do the speed round then. We want to know your microphone, where it's plugged in. I already know your interface. You have great, you have great taste in interfaces, I must say. But anyway, um, and then and then where you record it, and then what software you use to do post production and 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 editing and all that stuff. Take us through it real quick. All right, so I have the Pile Pro PD mic, which is kind of like a knockoff of the SM57. And from that, it goes XLR into the Mix Pre 6, Mix Pre 6 to the MacBook Pro. And then in the MacBook Pro, I have Zencaster and I record in that, do a backup on the Mix Pre. And then post production, I bring it into Adobe Audition and uh, edit it down there, add some uh, compression and you know take out some breaths and stuff. And export that, run it through Auphonic to level it, and send it to Libsyn. Wow! Do you hear that, everybody? That was a really good speed round. Thank you for... Uh, Enough speed? <laughs> thanks for the speed, dude. All right, so we're going to pick our way through this. But uh, And you also have um, Isotope RX-6, right? Yeah, yeah. So when I interview people, uh, it's, it's hit or miss sometimes. It's gotten better over time, but... Uh, I swear that I interviewed somebody and I think they were recording in like the 
the median of a highway. Um, so, <laughs> you heard traffic going both ways? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh so my God. RX-6 helps out. Wow. So, uh, all right, well, let's... And this is your first podcast ever, the show, the co-recursive show? I started by being a guest host on another show called Software Engineering Daily. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So I just started doing it on my, on my own. Oh, I see. So you were a guest on that show many times. And then you're like, hey, I want to do my own. Yeah. Well, I was like a guest host where I interviewed people. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm doing that uh, for another show as well called uh, Software Engineering Radio. I don't know if anybody who listens is a software developer at this, but uh, I've done a number of software podcasts. You know who is a software developer? I'm just going to say his name. It's going to it's going to land on your ears and and everyone listening. This name is going to land on your ears with such delight. Ready? I'm ready. Ralph M Rivera. <laughs> Ralph M Rivera everybody, he's a software engineer. I did not know that. I I know you mention him all the time. I do not know who he is. <laughs> He's like the he's like the father of podcasters toolbox, man. He's the guy. Awesome. He's sitting there at the screen with his face like an inch from the screen coding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, him and I hung out in our episode 100. I recently tweeted about episode 100. If you haven't heard episode 100 of the show, it's awesome. Um, although it's my show, so I probably shouldn't be the one saying that. But um, anyway, Ralph's with me and 19 previous guests sent in audio roasting me. And then I also played uh i created a 10 minute piece of audio demonstrating what the different adjectives for audio sound like so you know fat thin harsh mid-rangey like i, I literally demonstrated all that so anyway episode 100 so all right so yeah. you started your own show and um so the pile pro microphone i think we've talked about this on the show before but the the pd that's the mic it is yeah, yeah. I, I think I heard about it on the show. Uh, it's it's pretty inexpensive. And before that, I had the ATR 2100. That was like the first one I started with. And this one sounds way better, uh, but it, it's still pretty inexpensive. Right? It's just a regular handheld. Yeah. It looks like an SM58. Yeah. Wait, and the cable? Oh, no. It, I guess it comes with a cable that's XLR to quarter inch. That's what it's showing me on Amazon. <laughs> that's like... Oh, I have it plugged in XLR. Right, you have an XLR to XLR, and you're you're plugged in. That's good. Yeah, normally when you see a mic online, and like if the mic has a cable attached, and on the other end of the cable it's like a quarter inch plug, and it, it, even it's quarter inch unbalanced here. So, uh, but anyway, that's sometimes you just gotta watch it because some. Well, not not that you gotta watch it, but um, sometimes that's like almost like a karaoke microphone kind of thing. Wait a minute, <laughs> this mic costs thirteen dollars and ninety eight cents. Yeah. What? And uh, I think, yeah, it was on your previous episode. They uh, somebody talked about how there's this sure uh, cover for it, like a pop filter that makes it sound uh, quite good. So right. I got that as well, and it's like you know twenty dollars more than the mic or something. But <laughs> oh wait, so well yeah, describe so the <laughs> describe the pop filter setup then. Um, so sorry, it's the it's not a pop filter. It's the the foam cover. What do you right. call that? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's the Shure A eight one WS. So it's I think it's a it's supposed to be a filter for a cover for uh, SM fifty seven. I see, and it just barely fits on. I think that was Alan Tepper. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Alan Tepper. What a guy! What a guy! I'm gonna see him at NAB. Oh wait, I'm not supposed to mention that because we're recording so far in advance. So all right, you got that set up for your mic, and what kind of stand do you have it on? What kind of stand do I have it on? Is it a stand or a boom arm or how, what's yeah, holding it? Yeah, it's a boom arm and it says Rode on it. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. about all I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, the Rode, I forget what they call it, the Rode boom arm, but that's a good one, actually. Yeah, it, it works great. Yeah, because I, I still have the old Heil PL2T and it's, I don't know, it's okay, I guess. But the Rode boom arm is supposed to be much better. Um, yeah, it's it's super long, so like it it can definitely you know get it right where I need it. Right, and then for your interface slash recorder slash mixer, you have a Sound Devices Mix Pre Six. That's right. That's awesome, man. So here's what's interesting though: you have a Mix Pre Six, which is 
I have one, and it's awesome. Period. It's like one of the best pieces of gear I've ever owned. It's just great. But that costs nine hundred dollars, and your <laughs> microphone costs thirteen ninety eight. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can see the the order of upgrades as they're traveling through my gear here. I mean, do you? Oh, I see. I, I right. So you're 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 piece by piece upgrading. So you didn't get to the mic yet, right? That's right. That's right. I was going to ask you if you if you are you like a real rock and roll guy where like you smash your microphone after every episode. <laughs> No, it seems pretty solid though. I think I could, I could get away with that. With you this one. right? You could probably, yeah. It looks like you could throw that thing around and smash it a little. We should do a test. I, although Rick Veers must have already done testing like this, like just like run over the mic with a car and then plug it in and record. Like <laughs> we should do that at Podcast Movement. So, oh, my phone's ringing from across the room with the new ringtone on my new phone, which I'm not used to yet. I hear the, I hear a sound. I'm like, what the heck is that? <laughs> like, oh, it's my phone ringing. So I don't know. <laughs> Can you hear that? I can't hear it, actually. Anyway, it's, it's across the room because nowadays I keep my phone in airplane mode. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and if I do have it, if I do turn it on, then I keep it a little far away because the, uh, the radiation and stuff, you know, anyway. The radiation. Yeah. I have mine on Do Not Disturb, but then if it does buzz, sometimes you know I try to keep it not on the uh, the table here because it'll vibrate everything, just makes uh, a horrible noise. Right. So the mix pre, have you brought the mix pre out into the field, or you just been using it in your studio? Just here in my studio. Although I would like to, you know, try. I have, I have, you know, it takes batteries. It has, you know, you can record right onto it, but I haven't used those features of it. Right. Really, just using it as like a mic preamp. That's cool. That can record. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's just great. Like it's, it's an interface and a recorder. So like I do the same thing. My mic is plugged into my mix pre six and it's going into the computer. I'm recording it in the computer, but I'm also recording on the mix pre. Why not? Just hit record. <laughs> yeah. So that has saved me like a number of times. I have like the largest, uh, card that I could get in this thing. And I always record in Zencaster and, uh, on the mix pre six. And I have had, you know, Zencaster, problems of various sorts and been so glad so glad that i have that backup totally yeah and then apparently in the mix pre-6 also you can do a you can do mixing so now for for the podcasting application we don't really need to do this but for instance if you had uh several let's say you had four microphones plugged in and four people sitting around a table um you could actually like turn down certain participants and turn up other participants and and sort of on the fly you can mix down those four mics into the the stereo recorder which is on the inside the mix pre six as well so so technically it is a mixer and and i and yeah if, so for live applications that would be really handy too right because if you want to turn someone down or creep someone up you can do that I actually had uh, had to send my mix pre uh, in for repairs uh, quite recently, actually. Really? What was wrong with it? So the screen got burnt in. So I just use it as my as my mic pre here. So I leave it on most of the day. And uh, the, the kind of uh, level thing got burnt into the LCD. But really? they were actually really good to deal with. They replaced it. Wow. So you just, you had to mail it, ship it back and they replaced it? Yeah, so they replaced the screen. They they sent me back with a brand new screen. Got it. Yeah, they were super great about that. Right. Yeah, they're they're a good company. They're they're a solid company. I mean, great quality. That's. I mean, how 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 many times do I have to say it right on this show? <laughs> um, although, oh, I don't know if I could say it yet. I just got in the mail today uh, a, a loaner from another company. I'm, I'll announce it soon. Yeah, um, it's it's a it's an interface with a it's it's a it's a higher end interface sort of sort of like the mix pre six but different anyway i'm going to be testing that out and stuff so anyway i'll i'll talk about it soon so the mix pre nice. and so just describe the room you're in tell us tell us what your quote unquote studio is like so um it's a small room in my house it's it's basically my home office where i work out of and then i also record my podcast here so i got a big uh stand-up desk with uh you know, uh, boom with my mic on it, mix pre six sitting next to it. And then a MacBook pro that it's plugged into. And then plenty of desk space for me to pile up 
papers and forget about them. <laughs> and so it sounds like um, you're you're staying at a very consistent distance from the mic. So you're using pretty good mic technique, aren't you? Well, that's good to hear. I'm never quite sure, right? I, I'm trying to get good at this, but uh, I'm learning as I go. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 pretty simple. Yeah. I mean, if you're just when you're talking, you just got to be at the same distance and just talk normal. But and then, you know, because that's a that's a mistake so many people make. In fact, that's like there, there are so many little things that contribute to the sound. And like, let's say there's 20, 20 little things and the beginner gets like 18 of them wrong. And then they wonder why they sound like crap. And the pro gets 20 out of 20 and they sound great. So it's like, maybe I should come up with a product, like how to, how to record good audio or how to sound good on your own podcast or something. But I guess that's what podcast engineering school is for. There you go. I, I've noticed some comedians before that have podcasts like, uh, the beautiful anonymous podcast with Chris Gethard. Like he, you can hear, like he knows when he's getting loud, he like turns away from the mic. Like you can hear him laugh, but the laugh is like, he's obviously yeah, like learned some sort of way to moderate his volume. Yeah. Yeah. The laughing that I do, I lean back when, like when I laugh, I throw my head back and sort of like, so I end up being about a foot away from my mouth ends up being about a foot away from the mic and sort of pointing up toward the ceiling too. Like, ah, and it just takes that for the force of the laugh a little further away from the mic and it just it's perfect. Nice. That's one of those things it's like in person versus speaking into a mic on a, and and being recorded. Like it's two different things. Yeah, and and we can't see you to know that, right? Or if it was a video maybe I'd pick that up. Yeah, well, I'm going to start making videos actually, Adam. I don't know uh <clears throat> I haven't really announced it yet, but and I'm and I haven't announced it because I'm I'm sort of planning to start, but I haven't started yet. And I don't wanna, you know, <laughs> I don't wanna say, hey, I'm gonna start making videos, and then like nine months from now, you guys are like, uh, oh, Chris, uh, where's the videos, dude? So <laughs> I'm gonna wait until I start putting them out. I made one test one. I I made a test video and I sent it to uh, of course, the incomparable band Drew Scott. And I said, dude, what do you think? And he's like, dude. Oh wait, hold on. Bar Barry knows what he said. Barry, what did what did he get? Uh, what what was Bandrew's response to me when I asked him how my video was? Yeah. Oh wow. Forget it. Awful. Okay, so that's the mixed breed. Then you got your MacBook Pro. How how new is your MacBook Pro? Oh, it is not new at all. It is my wife's old MacBook Pro. <laughs> oh wow. All right. So like five, seven years old. Yeah, maybe maybe five. Yeah. All right. And then you're using Zencaster. So have you tried any other of the services? Um, I have not. I have not tried them at all. I've So I've used Zoom before as a backup when things go horrible, but I think that the audio is kind of uh, all compressed. So I don't know how great that is. Mainly Zencaster. Okay. Cool. And then, uh, okay, so then you, you're using Adobe Audition. That's right. Which uh, so you pay? Do you pay the twenty bucks a month, or do you buy the whole suite for like fifty bucks a month? Uh, I have the monthly thing for audition. Okay. Yeah. See, twenty bucks a month. I don't know. That's that's a lot, right? It is. It is. You know, it's one of those things that once you get used to using audition, <laughs> for example, like it's hard to switch to something else. It just feels like this is the way things should work. Yeah, I know, but that's how they get you. <laughs> you know? Oh, totally. I don't know. I, I'm not saying there's anything ethically wrong with that, but like, I don't know. I, I don't have a good business mind like that. Like some people know how to just like get people to, you know, to get on an email list or to, to buy this or sign up for that or whatever. And, and they have a way of sort of reeling you in slowly or something. I don't know. I don't know how anyone does it, but I'm not, that's one thing I don't know how to do. I'm I'm always just more of like a, like a simple guy, like, like, Hey, that's yeah. a lot of money. 20 bucks a month for a doll. That's a lot. Yeah. And the month, the monthly subscriptions, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I never feel great signing up for them, but you know, there's a lot of, that's a big piece of software. And you know, as a software developer, you know, I know that there's people just like working away on it all the time. And, uh, yeah. 
I don't mind paying their salaries a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. I do agree with that for sure. And there are things I know I pay for that, like today, I for some reason I stumbled. Oh, I know, I, I had to update my because on my Mac I have uh, I have the Microsoft whatever I don't know what they call it 365 or something because because mm. I need Word and Excel and PowerPoint right just mm. I don't know I feel like I need them because I kind of use them too and other people send me stuff in those formats and it's like whatever so but I but I found out that I was paying that I'm paying I don't know what is it like 70 bucks a year just to oh, have wow. just to have Word Excel and PowerPoint and a few others maybe that which I don't use and I was like really I did, I forgot so and and that's what I hate. It's like when you forget you're paying for something, and like two years later, you're like, "Why am I doing this? Why am I paying for this?" So anyway, yeah, I looked up get you. for the Microsoft Office 365. I looked up and I was like, "Well, can I just cancel it and keep the keep the versions I have on my machine?" And the answer is no. If you don't pay, they they don't work. You'll open up Word and it'll be like, "Oh, it doesn't work. Sorry, you got to sign up." Yeah, I think uh, Google Docs is where it's at. I've I've migrated totally towards using Google Docs for everything. Right, totally. And there's something else. What else? Oh no! Uh, years ago, I think when I signed up for Amazon Prime, I must have like checked a box or something where I signed up for uh, Audible. Now, like the Audible monthly program or something. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like I don't know, like twenty bucks a month or fifteen bucks a month, and and I I didn't know. And and then on my in the Audible app, I kept getting these uh, notices like, hey, you have five credits. Go, you know, <laughs> buy a book. And I'm like, oh, wow, cool. So I'd buy some books. And then like a few months later, it'd be like, oh, you have three more new credits. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. And then <laughs> like literally years later, I found out that I've been paying whatever it is, 20 bucks a month for this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm picking out books that are just crap because I don't know what else to pick. And they're like, oh, you got to use your credits or they'll go away. And I'm, you know, oh, <laughs> anyway, I'm an idiot. I know this. No one has to tell me. Not even Barry. I, I think I dozed off or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He dozed <laughs> off. So audition. Tell me about how you like uh, audition because you I mean, have you ever had any audio training in your life? I have not. I, I have not. So I've just been kind of learning uh, as I go. So uh, what I do in audition is is probably maybe unusual, but like I have two audition templates, one that I call like edit down. And so I take the raw audio files and I bring them into this template and I time stretch them. So they're like double, so they're double speed, but basically the same pitch. And then I listen through in that kind of condensed format and I cut out all of the, uh, like vocal flubs and restatements and and pauses and stuff. And then I like unstretch it to bring it back to the full size and bounce those to new files. So that's kind of how I do the, um, I don't know, the detailed editing, I guess. Interesting. So when you, 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 you don't stretch them, you actually compress them, right? Yeah. 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 I use the stretch feature to compress it. Right. So you compress them down so they're smaller. And then, and then when you press play, it ends up, playing back twice as fast because you made it twice as small yeah okay and so i'm wondering again i don't use adobe audition but i'm wondering they may have a, a playback speed adjustment where you can just keep it normal and just play it back at two times speed is that a is that a possibility yeah so they have a playback speed but it it uh like the pitch gets uh the pitch doesn't stay the same right it gets high pitched oh normally i just found this in reaper too there, there's a there's a a little checkbox for that where you can tell it to keep the original pitch and it will. Oh, wow. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Maybe I missed that. It, it's something when I first started, I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And then I'm like, yeah, the time stretch seems to work for me. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good, that's a good workaround. I mean, as long as you can still like zoom in to find enough detail, because, you know, one thing when I'm detail editing, well, I do detailed editing in a in, in a separate program. I don't use my DAW, but um. Uh, so so when you're doing detailed editing, what does what does detailed editing mean to you? What do you do? Mainly just two things. One is like muting something, and one is like cutting something out. So I have two hotkeys 
set up for that. So I listen through like if there's if there's too big of a space uh, between you know between words, um, or if somebody says something uh, kind of twice, I will either kind of mute it or just cut it out on both tracks. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So if there's too big of a space, you'll cut it out. Wait, when will you mute it? So sometimes somebody will, for instance, say a word that doesn't add anything, but if you cut it, then kind of the spacing is wrong. So then I'll just just mute that part out, but but leave it there, right? So that the spacing is still there, but it seems more like they pause. Yes, yes. But I love doing that, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's so, that's a a common mistake for the amateur editor is it, it, it in exactly this scenario it usually it happens with ums like someone will start the sentence with um and then they'll continue like they'll be like um i think the blah 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 right so <laughs> if you just cut out the um most times the t- it, the timing will be off like it'll they'll take in a breath and then they'll just start talking and it's like weird like what so that's when it comes in handy to do exactly what you're doing was instead of taking out the um you mute it and sometimes and that works really well the other taking it one step further you could mute the um Mm -hmm. and then take out some of it maybe half half of that empty space you could take out because sometimes if you keep all that space in there that's too much space it's just too it's almost like an awkward pause so yeah, I have done that as well. And I guess the third thing that happens that's a little bit like those I can do pretty quick because I just have like hotkeys or whatever. Right. But the the one that's trickier is when people talk over each other and you have to kind of spread it out. Uh, you know, one person laughs while somebody else is finishing. I like to kind of spread those out so people aren't talking over each other. Right. Yeah. Spreading them out is is sometimes works. The other thing you can do, like especially if if someone's laughing while someone else is talking, you can you can just lower their laughter. Uh, like lower it like three like three or four db or five or six db something like that or even if they yeah, laugh yeah. really loud you can even bring it down like seven or eight db but probably four to six db you could bring it down and then it's still there and it's good because it's it still feels live but and the laugh is still there but it's just not loud and you can still hear every word the person is saying who's talking it's a good idea yeah that's a little trick there yeah a lot of lot of editing tricks and um fades you f- you fade in and out of anything so do i fade in and out of anything um not really like so when i do the final version of the podcast when i add in intros and stuff uh you know I bring in some music and then kind of fade it out uh to kind of blend the interview into like a recorded introduction um but not really any to the actual uh dialogue yeah so sometimes well, f- fading individuals, individual tracks is is really handy when if, if someone is has a lot of background noise in the background and you're going to make cuts like like if you're going to remove an um, like let's say let's say your guest like literally has an air conditioner on in the room <laughs> and, and you cut out an um and you leave that space there. That blank space is going to sound really strange because the, there's going to be air conditioner, air conditioner, air conditioner, then silence. And then they start talking again, and it's like pe- the listener is going to be like, "What the heck just happened?" So in those kind of cases, like you can literally, if you do like short little fade ins and fade outs, you can so it'll f- sort of fade in the air conditioner a little bit slowly, so it, it it's it's more uh, transparent. Like people don't people aren't bothered by it, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. It's not an abrupt change. It's like, whoa, what 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 happened? Like instead of that reaction, it's just. You know, you do, you still hear it. You cut, you hear it come in a little more slowly, but it's it's just gentle and and it doesn't jolt people. You know, that's one thing you don't want to do. Well, unless you're going for that effect, which <laughs> Ralph M. Rivera goes for that effect all the time. I've definitely had guests where it sounds like yeah, the room they're in is like sitting on some giant electrical transformer or something. <laughs> Yeah, those are tough because then then you you're like okay, then you trying to use noise reduction, which you can do. You know, you can that helps a little bit, and and then you can use you know a gate or or, a, or an expander right to to push that noise down further. But it's just it it never works out perfectly, right? It's always a big 
pain in the butt if there's that much background noise. So that's why yeah. I would I wouldn't even start recording. Like if I if I connected with a guest and there literally was that much noise, I would literally say like, "Well, we got to move to a different room or something." Cuz we can't record like that. I would yeah, just Yeah, that's something it. I've been learning, I guess, is that maybe sometimes the interview should stop rather than me try to make it sound better uh <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, at that point it comes down to like, all right, either you just got to get the interview done and put out an episode, or are you really going to fuss and, you know, put off an interview two and a half months just because it wasn't right, you know, it was going to be a headache. So it's, it's a decision we all have to make at, at some point. Yeah, and for me, uh, like I've been using RX-6 when I hit tough spots like that. I mean, it can only get so much better, but uh, the, the thing I like about it is it, a lot of times I can just find the right thing to apply. And if it's not horrible, the, you know, the quality coming in, it will really clean it up. Right. So when do you use RX-6 in your, in your workflow? So um, I use a couple uh, plugins when I'm doing my final version, but the times when I really uh, use it a lot is when there's some sort of problem that's bothering me with the guest audio. Um, so like the most frequent one is just the person uh, has like a lot of room noise. Like it's kind of like an echoey room right. and I didn't really notice it during the interview. But when I listen back, I don't know why that is. But it's when I listen back, I realize like, oh my God, there's a lot of room noise, you know, kind of sounds like they're in a bathroom or something. Right. Well, let me ask you this. When you're playing it back, are you using a compressor on it? Or a limiter? Well, I guess I, I listen to it raw usually, so no. But yeah. Okay. Does that make it worse? Uh, yeah, if you if you if if there's if it's in a reverby room and then you use a compressor, it will it'll make the reverb sound louder. Yeah. Ah. Uh. Yeah. So that's why you should do if you're gonna use like in RX six, if you're gonna use the D reverb, mm -hmm. you do that first. Yeah. Then So that is what I do. Okay. And I found the D reverb to be a tricky plugin to work with. Like it can work really well in certain cases, but it's very finicky. I don't know if you found the same thing. Yeah, well, it's finicky because it's it's not As magic. An impossible task. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 difficult. Like if you're if you're using more than I'd say six dB of of reduction on reverb. That's a lot. It's going to start harming the sound of the voice. Even before that, even if you use 3 dB of re reduction of reverb, you can start to hear the voice be compromised and, and you know, start to yeah. be being destroyed. So that, you just got to be, it's, it's a fine line. It's, it's, you know, again, nothing, it's not magic. So you got to decide like, how much am I going to use or how much am I not going to use? And Yeah. I always like, I always end up listening back after applying it. So it oftentimes, yeah, it makes it worse. And I find the trick is there's like a, a slider for, for like the, the length of seconds of like the reverb. I think it's like zero to seven or something. And uh, there's like getting that just right. And then uh, basically I turn it up all the way and try to find that the place where it removes the reverb the most. And then I like turn it down to like, you know, quite a minimal amount of reduction. Mm. Try that. Right. So you're saying when you're when you're getting your settings right, you maybe you take out like 15 dB of reverb. Yeah. And then you wh while it's taking out 15 dB of reverb, then you're adjusting the other settings to make it sound as best you can. And then after you get the settings right, then you go back and and then bring it down. So instead of taking out 15 dB, you might bring it down to six. Exactly. That's the way. I found to that's the only way I I've managed to use it without making it sound like a robotic or or adding some weird effects to the voice. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. And you could do that with other audio processing as well. You can do that with EQ. If you want to add some low end to someone's voice, crank up the low end. Like add 15 dB of low end and make it ridiculous and and but while it's cranked up there then you can sweep the frequency. You could find where the frequency is the, the nicest and the smoothest. Then after you find a good frequency, then you bring it down. Instead of adding 15, you add two. <laughs> yeah, and and by the way, that... if, you, if you do that, one thing you got to do... So <laughs> here's the thing. If you, do, if you use a technique like I just described, when you 
when you bring it back down from adding 15 dB to adding two, it's going to, it's going to sound too thin. It's going to sound like there's no low end in the voice. You're going to be like, oh, this is really thin, but it's really not thin, but it's thin compared to what you were just hearing for three minutes while you were messing with it. Right. So, so what you can do, this is a little trick I do. So you, you crank it up, you add 15 dB a low end, you, 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 you sweep the frequencies, you find a frequency. Now, instead of dropping it from fi adding 15 to adding two, go down past zero, subtract 10 or 15 for like a few seconds, like 10 seconds or even five mm. seconds and just listen to it. Then it'll be really thin. It'll sound like the person's on the phone. There'll be absolutely no low end. Then you put it back to zero. And then you listen again for five seconds. And then you, then it's flat. It's where you started. It's flat. And then you hear it. And then you, then you start creeping up the low end. So you add one dB, one and a half, two. Then, then you find that sweet spot. That's a good way to... It's almost like cleansing your palate, right? It's, yeah. That, that's what it is. It's, and it really, it really works. Because your ears, they get used to it. I've, I've done this, like not with EQ, but trying to get rid of background noise and like done a bunch of things. And then like I was showing my wife, I like played one version and then the other. And she's like, oh, I agree. Like the second version's way better. I'm like the second version is the version where I've done nothing. <laughs> like, ah, oh, you tried the trigger. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. But it's good. You get used to it and you don't hear that it's actually worse. Like, <laughs> yeah. Know. Yeah. Well, again, it comes back to the recording. So if, if you can record it, properly 95 percent of your problems are are non-existent non totally all right so what else you do with rx6 so i use that for d reverb then um like the example i had where somebody had all this horrible car noise in the background i used this rx6 uh vocal isolate and it's really it can really remove a lot of background noise um, but it does have the problem wherein like if a car honks, it will actually be able to take it out, but then the person's uh, like voice will get much quieter because there was just less of it left. So, so that one I've used occasionally, but not uh, it, it's dangerous, I guess. <laughs> so you're saying after you use it um, in the space where the car horn was just for that quick second, their voice seems to drop down in level two. Yeah, totally. And so it ends up like it, the, the audio sounds better, but it sounds strange. Right. I've used, uh, there's one called deconstruct, which is useful to just kind of turn the background noise down a bit. I don't know how it does it, but it seems to work quite well. Deconstruct. I don't know if I've used that one. Yeah. So it, I think it has settings like one for vocals and one for other and you can kind of adjust the dB up and down on each of them. So it kind of tries to attempt to identify what, you know, components of the sound are like background noise and what aren't. And you can adjust them up and down. Wow. So it gives you like faders, like you can like move the voice up and the noise down or something. Yes. I mean, but like it's, it's guessing, right? So I wouldn't use it too heavily, but uh, that works quite well. And then uh, the only other thing I've used uh, is there's like a transients plugin. Like I had one guest who just there was a lot of like pops and clicks and weird low pitch noises um, on their end, like that they couldn't hear, but was coming through on the recording. And the transients feature, uh, it does great. It just pulls them all out. Where is that transients feature? Uh, I don't even know. It's somewhere in there. Okay. Is it in, you mean in the vocal isolate or in RX6 in general? Sorry, in RX6, there's something called remove transients. And I didn't know what that term was, but I guess it's basically anything that's like happens for a very short amount of time. Uh, so it finds like pops and clicks and, and you can turn them down. Right. Yeah. Transients are things that get loud real quick and then just disappear real quick. So it's like, like a snare drum is a transient. So it's like, bam, like bap. Even with voice or a clap, that's a transient. And um, yeah, I don't know how how well it would do with uh, like a click is definitely a transient, but usually it's buried within the sound of a voice, let's say. So yeah. I don't know if the wave actually creates this separate little peak for the, the little click. I don't know. 
Yeah, the time I used that, it was something strange. Like there was pops and clicks, but they weren't of a person's voice. They were like, I don't know, sounds like some sort of bad signal coming through or something. I never managed to remove them. Mm. All right, and then you use Auphonic. So, well, let, let's paint the picture of, of your final mix in Audition. So you got the you got the music in Audition, you got the you and your guest on separate tracks, and you've already gone through and done editing. What else is there for your mix? Yeah, so there is like a pre-recorded intro. Then I take a piece of the guest's uh, speech that I find kind of interesting as like a teaser. Um, and then I have a kind of an intro that I record and then I have some kind of background audio that fades, fades that into the interview. And then there's the two interview tracks and then there's kind of like an outro with some, some backing music. So I have kind of a template where a lot of that's set up and then I just drag the stuff in. Um, and then, yeah, I have some, I have some things applied there. Like I have a compressor and a de and some vocal EQ. Okay, and what are you using those uh, processors on? Each voice? Um, yeah, so the compressor, I think that I have the compressor and uh, isotope breath control that's on like the master track. And then on each voice, I have the audition EQ setting sent to like vocal enhance. And then I have a RX mouth declick and RX de and those I kind of uh, sometimes I need them and sometimes not but I kind of have them there in the template and I'll, I'll kind of tweak them if need be okay so wait what what did you say was on your master bus the the breath control uh, yeah there's a compressor and this isotope breath control because I, I found the compressor this could be me doing something wrong but the compressor will really bring up people's like in breaths they would become really loud so I put this breath control after it seem to help right so okay so if you are so but that's on your master bus so that's also affecting the music um yeah yeah that's true <laughs> so so one thing you could do and and again there's nothing wrong with what you're doing like if it's working then it's totally fine obviously i mean there are you know you can't really do anything wrong as long as it sounds good in the end right that's all so but you might want to, instead of having the breath control on the master bus, you could put the breath control on each person's track individually. Uh, but then, like you said, you, you bring up a good point that when you compress someone's voice, y yeah, you will, you know, since you're compressing their voice, it, it, perceptually their breaths will become louder. So, uh, so yeah, you, you can use a deep breath there. So instead of using the D breath on the master bus, you could set up a, a subgroup. So it could be a subgroup of your you and your guest's voice being mixed together onto this little subgroup. And then on that subgroup track, you could use the breath control. So in that, then the breath control would be acting upon your two voices, but not upon the music. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so the music should... And it's is it music from... Uh, you know, like a one of these services where you can, you know, royalty free music you can buy and use it every episode kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And the music's pretty, pretty minimal. I just have uh, some music in the intro at the beginning and then some music at the end and then a little bit of background music that kind of fades in the interview. But yeah, I'm okay. going to try that. That's a good tip. Yeah. Usually the music it doesn't need to be compressed again. It, <laughs> I mean, it's okay if it is. It's not a, you know, it's not a big deal, but. Um, usually when you when you purchase music from these royalty free music places it's already mixed and mastered and compressed and leveled and it's it, i mean it, it and it's and, and a lot of times it's even too compressed like it just yeah. sounds way loud compared to so what what you'll hear on an amateur podcast is that the music is really loud and compressed and then the voice that doesn't have any compression on it so it's it's hard to mix those two things together, like a really compressed music track and then the voice with zero compression, because at times the voice is going to be louder than the music and at times it's going to be lower than the music and it's it's hard to match them up. 
So anyway, but so for royalty free music, usually you don't have to do any compression or anything. Uh, sometimes, well, a lot of times I will EQ it slightly because one thing on those royalty free music tracks, a lot of times they'll be almost too much high end, like too much clarity. So you could just uh. roll off the high end a little. It just, it, it doesn't, cause, cause when your voice comes in, when, when the host voice comes in, if the music is too bright, then the voice will sound dull. And that's only if the music is too bright. If it's if it's fine, then just leave it. But if it's too bright, then yeah, you can roll off a little bit of high end. And sometimes roll off a little bit of low end too, like very low end, like literally 50, 50 hertz and below. Or sometimes even on the on the Sheps 73 EQ, there's a setting where it's what's the low frequency? I think it's 32. Anyway, it's like thir- it's a, or 30. <laughs> It's like 30 hertz. I'll roll off 30 hertz by like 0.3 dB. And it literally makes it, it cleans it up. And it's the low end is is not so huge and massive and overpowering the entire episode. I did find like, yeah, putting the music in was hard. Like, so I have it, I have it quite quiet, but it, it, it doesn't seem quiet, I guess. And then I also have a, uh, I was using at some point like a side channel compressor that would kind of bring the music down as the like dialogue came in, but I found it, it was like a bit, it was, it was too apparent. Like the music would kind of suck down as, as the speech came in. Right. Yeah. That's a good observation. So I, yeah, I use those, I side chain my intro music as well. The trick there is if it, if it feels like the music is being sucked down too much, um, you just got to adjust the, the amount of compression that that's happening on the music. So it might be pushing it down. I don't know. Let's say, 8 dB. Well, if, if it's pushing it down 8 dB and that's too much, then bring it up to like, so it's only pushing it down 4 dB uh. or try 3 dB. So, and in fact, that's what I've found. Uh, anywhere between, I'd say, 4 and f- like around 4 or 5 dB, that's a good amount for the music to be pushed down when you're speaking over it. That generally See. speaking, you always have to listen and use your ears and every, all that, but... I think mine was at 12, so that's probably the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and I always try to when I do that, I always I always want it to be as transparent as possible. So I I I want it to be like 4 dB or sometimes I'll try 3. And you know what I mean? Cuz I just I want it to be subtle because you still want to hear the music, but you just want to make a you want to create a little bit of space for the voice. And you just need a little bit of space. But it yeah, also that makes sense. But it also depends on how compressed the voice is. The more the more compressed the voice is, then the less space you have to make for it. So if you if you're really sense. like compressing the crap out of your voice, then with the side chain you probably only have to push it down like two three dB. That makes sense. Yeah, and so how are you? How happy are you with the your final episodes in terms of the levels of like the music and the voices and the how are the levels to you? Um, I think, I think good, but it took me a while. Like definitely the first time I added music at the end and kind of had like an outro on my podcast, when I listened back to it on my actual, uh, phone, like I was like, this music is way too loud. Um, so I kind of, I don't know, it doesn't sound as loud, uh, when you're like mixing it (laughs) and later one, I don't know if you've found that. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's, well, I'm, I, I have, I mean, I have like studio monitors and I have a good monitoring setup. So I, uh, I'm pretty clear on what I'm hearing. That's part of my deal. But, um, but yeah, no, that's it. It's, it's good to check your mixes on other speakers and you'll hear different things. And it's very valuable in terms of, in terms of that. One weird thing I found and I haven't, uh, I guess, well, anyway, I'll just tell you my observation and I don't know what it means, but it's, what I found, so I have several clients and they use, I use the same intro and outro music for, for every one of their episodes, right? So, mm-hmm. and on the intro music, it comes in, when the music starts, it's at zero, like the fader is at zero, right? Let's say it's just, mm-hmm. just is what it is. Um, and then when the person comes in speaking, I'll bring the level down a bit and maybe do the side chain thing too, whatever. But what I found at the end, if I have the music start coming in slowly under the, you know, 
underneath the the host voice at the end. And then as soon as they start talking, what I've found is if I bring it back up to zero, that's way too loud. It it just feels way too loud. I don't know why. So literally, I usually bring it up to minus two or sometimes minus one, but I, I don't bring it all the way up to zero because for some reason, it just seems too loud. Same thing with the level, like when the host is talking over the music. In the intro, let's say the, let's say the music level is at minus four and the host is talking over it and it sounds mm-hmm. fine. The, the, the balance sounds fine. At the end, when they're talking over the music, if I have the music at minus four, the music seems way too loud. <laughs> So <laughs> even there, I put the music down one or two dB. I don't know why. Maybe is it perception? Is it or is it just my taste? Can anyone verify this? <laughs> I know, like, like uh, there's some podcasts that do some neat tricks with music. Like This American Life, I notice sometimes they will like if they have a big a big point, like somebody's going to say something and it's going to end on a point. They will like as the person's talking for like two minutes, they'll like slowly bring up background music. And then when the person finishes like their big statement, they'll just take the music right off and leave like three or four seconds of like empty space. <laughs> and then it seems like really profound, whatever they said, right? Because everything is just quiet. Yeah. Right. That's a, it's, that's a great example of just perception, right? Like it's not about levels. It's not, a, I mean, levels are involved, but Creating that perception is what you can do with audio. That's what I love, right? Definitely. I mean, just by doing a little thing with the audio, you just enhance that moment so much. It's crazy. All right. So you, so after you, so then you mix it out of Adobe Audition, and mm-hmm. do you mix it? Do you export it as an MP3 file, and just that's your MP3? So I don't. So um, like there might be easier ways to do this, but what I do is I I mix it out as a FLAC file, which I end up storing. uh, And then I take the FLAC and I feed that into uh, Auphonics um, Leveler. And I use that to create the MP3 and and set the loudness level. Got it. Yeah, FLAC files. So um, yeah, Auphonic does a good job at that. Um, One thing you could do, Instead of using Alphonic, you could you you could do both those steps in RX six. Ah, oh. there is a, there's a module in RX six called Loudness. I believe it's called Loudness. I'm not I'm not going to open mine now because I'm I have like 19 <laughs> programs and recording on my computer going on. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's called Loudness, and so you can actually set the loudness to, you know, you, you publish in stereo. Yes. Yeah. So you publish in stereo. So you can set the loudness to minus 16 luffs, which is this, which is the unofficial standard. Or if you want to be like uh, some of these other cowboy podcasters, you could do minus 15. Yeah. Cause that, Ooh. that one extra luff is, <laughs> is really serious. Um, um, but no, that's, it's totally fine. But yeah. So in RX six, you can set the loudness to minus 16 luffs and you can also set the peak level. So to make sure it doesn't peak over zero or I set the peak level at minus one. And then, you, yeah, so then you run, you process that through RX6 and then you export from RX6 uh, as an MP3 file and then boom. Nice. Yeah, I, when I started off, like all I used was the Auphonic stuff and I kind of like its push button nature. So I haven't really removed it from my uh, sequence. <laughs> mm. Now, do you do your tagging with Alphonic or you just would use it to level it and make the MP3? Oh, I use some program. It's called like MP3 editor or something. Oh, ID3 that? editor. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I use that too. So I have a little template, I think, that you can load and then I just set the title and off to Libsyn. Yep, cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so technically you could cut Alphonic out, uh, out of your workflow there. I would like to simplify things. There's a lot of steps in the way I do things right now. Yeah, and so what I do with RX six, well, I I upgraded to RX seven, but it's pretty much the same thing. I have um, a module chain because you can actually make module chains. Did you know that? I did not know. Yeah. So when you go, it's at the very top on the right. It's like a module chain, I think they call it. Anyway, you can actually 
string together a bunch of modules into one little chain. So uh. instead of applying one process and then applying another and then another, you can line up like three or four processes and just hit go and it'll go through, bang them out, one, two, three, four. And so what I do is I first, I have a module. The first one is phase. I just correct the phase of it, which is usually not even necessary, but I just like doing that. The second one is the actual loudness, which sets the luffs level. And then the third one I do is I use an EQ and I roll off like about 35 hertz and below because mm. those low, super low frequencies, they're not, it, it, I don't know. It just sort of cleans up. I, I, it's hard to explain what it does. It just, it sounds rumbly without it, right? It's hard to hear. Yeah. It just takes out a little of that deep, deep rumble. It's not even, it's, it, it's not even that much. Maybe the average person wouldn't even know, but there's no need for those frequencies down that low. Like I know some people roll off, like from 60 hertz and below, stuff like that. That To me, that's a little crazy. 35 hertz, though. You ever hear a 35 hertz tone? I mean, that it's so low, man. And, and 20 hertz? Wow. So anyway, so those are the three things. I do the phase, the loudness, and the, I, the EQ with the roll-off. Um, and then that's it. Then when it's done, I have my stereo file. It's the right loudness. It's in phase. And I rolled off that super, super low end, which you don't need. Boom. I save it as a, well, I save it as a wave file. You would save it as a flack flack if you wanted to. Yeah. Actually, I don't know if RX can export as flack, but I would, I would save it as a wave. You yeah. should, I mean, flack is fine because it is technically uncompressed. Like it's not, you're not losing any data by using a mm -hmm. flack file. And yes, it can, it can be, you know, quite, you know, quite a bit smaller than a wave. But I don't know. I always like to just save everything as a wave. And just an the waves MP3. add up over time, don't you find? Like, oh, dude, I have hard. You, you know how many hard drives I have and everything. Oh, with all the clients I have. But I don't care, dude. I don't care. I'm I'm an audio engineer, and I'm gonna have the high resolution wave file of every episode I've ever done. Period. I don't care what anyone says. I'll buy a hard drive every every cup every two three years. I I spend another I don't know 150 bucks on a hard drive. Who cares? Have you had one fail before? Um, actually, I, I almost, I, I don't even remember ever going back to my old hard drives to get something. Uh, so I, and I don't know. So it's, for me, it's peace of mind. I know it's there and I know I got everything. So, and, and remember too, for me, this is business. I'm doing yeah. this for clients. They're paying me good money. So if they came to me later and said, oh, can I have the, the uncompressed file for episode, you know, 47? And I was like, oh, well, um, I don't keep the files for that long. Or, oh, all I have is an MP3. Like, no way. I'm a professional. <laughs> I need yeah. to have everything. <laughs> when, I, when I first started doing uh, the podcast on my own, I did all the editing and stuff based on an MP3 from Zencaster. And that, that did not work out well. I learned that one pretty quick. Well, yeah, I mean, so MP3s from Zencaster are actually pretty good. But I was I was running it through the DAW and applying things to it, and it just I think it just degrades every step or something. I'm not sure. <sighs> well, it depends what you do. So here's what most software does when you bring a file in, and I'm 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 I could probably say all software. This is what all software does when you bring in a file. I shouldn't say all, but this is what mo a lot of them do. When you drag an MP3 and drop it into Adobe Audition, mm -hmm. you'll see it does like a little, it takes like 10 or 20 seconds. It's sort of like almost like loads it or something. What mm -hmm. it's actually doing is creating a 32-bit float version of that MP3 file. So now it's not an MP3 file. It's an expanded 32-bit float file, which is huge. Uh which it's it's 32 bit is even way bigger than a 24 bit file which is which is big so that so within audition all the audio you bring in will be in 32 bit float so because it's not actually degrading there was just less less data there to begin with exactly really, it has exactly when it makes the 32 bit float file if it has to make it from an mp3 then yeah there's a lot less data there so that's awesome.
So yeah, so then when you mix it down, though, then you choose. Like, okay, mix it out of Adobe Audition into uh, a 24-bit WAV file. Boom. And then it'll mix it, and it'll create that file, and that's your file. Or or a FLAC, like, if you want it, or an MP3. So yeah, and if you look in RX6, too, look on the bottom. I think it's the bottom left. When you bring a file in, it'll say, I think it says 32-bit float or whatever. And when you export out of RX6 as a WAV, the default, well, I shouldn't say the default. Sometimes the default, well, it depends what file you brought in. Like if you bring in a 24-bit wave mm -hmm. to RX6, if you go to export it as a wave, it'll just default right to 24 because it knows that's what you brought it in at. But if you bring in a anything, an MP3 or anything, anything else, AAC, and you and you choose export as a wave, it, it defaults to 32-bit wave. Which I never, I never actually exported as 32 bit because I just always go to 24. 24 is more than enough resolution for for what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, you need too many hard drives. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and Barry, what do you think about all my hard drives? It's a mess. It's not really. It's not Barry, but it's <laughs> but it's a lot of hard drives, right? Oh, forget it. <laughs> This has been awesome. Adam Gordon Bell from the Co-Recursive Show. Thanks for hanging with me, man. Oh, it's been great. Thank you for having me. Right? It's been a lot of fun, and uh, uh, I hope you keep improving, As and, and I'm saying this to you and everyone listening, I hope you keep improving your production every day or all the time or, you know, as much as you can ongoing because I still... I'm messing with EQs and compressors and making stuff sound better all the time. I but I love it too. So, all right, everyone, you can check out uh, Adam's co-recursive show. The link will be in the show notes. And Adam, you know you have to yell "sound great" with me at the end, right? All right, let's try. Are you willing to really give it a <clears throat> go? Let's see. All right, let's go. Sound, sound great. great. Bye.